Hey, welcome in everybody to the next edition of the Philadelphia Philly Talk, Cash and Sports Fanatic News. I am Joe, joined by the Andrew, as we're going to dive into the great success of our Phillies lately, as they're now third in the NL East, uh, notched up for second in the wild card. The last I looked, um, right, or are we behind the Cardinals? What they do last night? The we're currently the no, number they, two team, two, we're number two, two spot in the wild card. After yeah, the yeah, because the Padres got swept. Yeah, by yep. the Dodgers. Okay, cool, perfect. So we're going to talk about that. How the Phillies are nine and one in their last ten and on a five game winning streak, um, and now they're going to in their next uh, matchup after sweeping the Nationals in a four game series, play the Miami Marlins at home, who they actually been good against this year. So hopefully that continues, and then play the Mets, who are the winning team that they're playing. Uh, for the, I think until mid September when they or something like that. I saw the stat on Twitter. It's like something ridiculous. The Mets are the only winning team we're playing for like the next month and some change. So the Phillies have to still take advantage of the schedule. I think that's something we can start off with, which they've been doing better than this year, minus the Cubs series. I would say, Andrew, wouldn't you say that's the best key to making the playoffs? Is continuing to do that, and then obviously finding ways to beat the Mets in that Mets series, who are clearly the best team you're playing going forward. Oh, yeah, without question. It's something we didn't see in the past. Um, it's taking advantage of a bad schedule. We saw last year you weren't able to get the job done and you missed the playoffs. You look at this year, I think we have a better team. I think we'd all agree with it. Um, you're going to stretch where, like you just said, the next month the Mets are the only team. And listen, I get it. We're, we're currently nine and a half games back, and that, that's unrealistic to probably sit here and say you're going to win the division. But – like you mentioned, the only team you still got, you got six games with the Mets from August, uh, what's the say? Today's August 8th. So from August, um, playing this weekend, so this Friday would be the 12th, I think. So for, yeah, from August 12th to the 25th, you, you play, or sorry, man, my Yeah, no, from August 12th to August 25th, you play the Mets six times. So if you're able to gain ground that way, that's how you get back in the division race. So I think I think this team obviously is going to take a lot, but with the schedule in hand and then that many games against the Mets that quick, if you're able to take say both series, you gain two games on them. There you go. Now you're talking about a different conversation. But as long as you're able to take care of business against the teams you're supposed to, I think there's no question you're going to be in the fight for the first wild card spot and get and get some home field advantage in, in round one. Yeah, and I think the big key of them taking advantage of it is in the past, you didn't really have continuous guys in the last couple of years as guys went down, step up. Where this year, that's a big difference as well. You had Derek Hall come up, and he's continued to have great success with a couple home runs in yesterday's game and a multiple hit series um, as well. So he comes in and has great success. Um, realistically, the DH saved the Phillies bacon, as Jim Jackson would say, for uh, <laughs> for hockey, just because they were able to put Hall in, and Harper was able to play part of the season until he's able to come back now. Um, so I, I think <clears throat> a huge bonus. Even Munoz had some good games for you. Now you called up Maton, and Maton went off in his first game back. Obviously, that's not going to be the thing you see every game, but like you see that you're getting good depth from lefty, righty side of the plate. You added Sosa, who's very good at defense. So I think the big difference with this team, the years past teams, is you don't want to see these guys get dinged up. But when they did, you had guys step up where that's been the big difference, where the only guy that really didn't, other than a couple blimps was DD, and that's why he ended up unfortunately getting DFA'd and we wish him the best as he goes elsewhere to get that a thousandth hit but everybody else has kind of been stepping into their place and stepping up for guys that have uh gone down and also lately Nick Castellanos has also hit that road as well and has been on a blazing hot streak which is something we've been waiting for for months so that's a huge asset as well so well, and not only that, on top of that, I think uh, you have to give credit where credit's due. And Rob Thompson came in here, and he trusts those young guys. You never got that from Girardi. You'd have a good game. Like, Maton came up last year and started well when he had his chance, and they didn't play him that much. You saw at the beginning of this year, Bryson Stott. He had his moments, but they never gave him a chance. 
Mickey Moniak. He never really had a chance this year when they said they thought they'd give him one. And he even said it when he went to the Angels. And I think you're seeing that now is Rob's playing these young guys every day. And you mentioned it, Derek Hall. He, he's having the opportunity. He's taking advantage of it. You look at Bryson Stott. He's, he's got his average up over 200. You look at Alec Bohm. He started the year hot, took a little skid. And uh, you saw Girardi after that bad defensive game bench him for a little while. But Rob is just letting these guys play. He understands baseball. You're going to go through some slumps. And that's what the young guys are doing a little bit. They got to adjust too. And, and you're finally seeing them get time and they're adjusting to the game. So you're finally seeing a Phillies team get their young potential. And you saw it. I mean, I get it's one game and it's the Nationals. So I'm not going to go too far of it. But how cool was it yesterday in the 13-1 to win? That was a homegrown infield. You had you had Derek Hall at first base. He's homegrown. You had Reese Hoskins at DH. He's homegrown. You had Nick Maton at second. He's homegrown. You had Stott at short, and uh, Alec Bowen at third, and Aaron Nola on the mound. That they were all homegrown guys. Obviously, the outfield's a different story, but Ver- if Verling would have started, that would have been another homegrown player. So it's cool to finally see these guys finally come in after all we talked about how our drafting's been bad and everything. Or our player development, you're starting to see it all click, in my opinion. No, I completely agree. I think it's all starting. To, and it's also a big thing due to Kevin Long uh, being here yes. as the hitting coach, kind of working through with these guys as well. So that makes a huge difference uh, when you have somebody that's so pumped up. Like, when you see your hitting coach, I understand this is a small aspect of the game, but what, what we also know Kevin Long is exceptional with the behind the scenes, what he does with the guys from everything you read from Salisbury to Alex Coffey and all the other writers. But the <clears throat> it's more he also is a guy that I think you just want to play for because you see him from the reactions when you watch how he reacts and gets uberly pumped up and all that for his hitters and really – uh, kind of like bust their chops or they're not playing well, but really ramps them up when they're playing well, that's a guy you want to play for. So I think that is a big difference the Phillies have compared to the more mundane hitting coach, which just d- didn't seem to work with the Phillies structure. And I think Cotham also has proven to be what um, articles kind of said about him when he came from the Rays, if I remember correctly. I thought it was, was the Reds. Reds? Reds? Okay. Um, different R team. Okay, Reds, not Rays. Um, I think. I but, think. I'm pretty sure. But either way, he's been doing good, and he's been getting guys. You saw, um, doing well. His Suarez has built back up well with him. Obviously, Will's pitch exceptional. Noah had one blimp year. They figured it out and got him, um, pretty good this year. So, uh, I think everything's coming to place. Gibby's been good this year too. So. I think those two coaches play a huge effect. And like you said, Rob Thompson has been huge because he just lets guys roll. And it kind of reminds you of the Charlie Manuel style of managing, of saying to like Jason Worth, yeah, I kind of am just going to let you roll, even though you haven't proven to hit righties yet. But we're just going to kind of let you roll. That's what they're doing with the Veerling Marsh platoon. Both of those guys are better fielders than hitters at this point. But that's how you get them to be better hitters, by letting them just roll and play out there. So that's why I think this team is better because they're having more confidence in their, um, I guess, cleats, so to speak, just because they're getting those opportunities and you're getting more reps. And that's what's going to be interesting if Derek Hall can become the beautiful bench back as Harp comes back or if Harper can play. But, but then if Harper can play the outfield, Castellanos is probably going to DH. So it's still going to – like, right. Hall's going to be the guy that will be interesting to see if he can transition when Harper comes back to being that great bench bat. That will be the interesting thing to see because that's ultimately probably what's going to have to happen. Oh, absolutely. That's what's going to have to happen. Obviously, you're not going to play. I mean, you might be able to get some platoon playing time a little bit as you ease Harper back into it. But, yeah, overall, I mean, Harper – Castellanos, especially with Castellanos back and swinging the bat well, are going to get the majority of the playing time. But, no, you're going to have to. I mean, you, you're you going to get to a situation in the playoffs, and it's going to be seventh to ninth inning, and you got a big spot. You're going to need a big bat. And, I mean, no offense to Matt Veerling, but that's a spot where if he's up, you're going to pitch it with Hall, and then you got to put Marsh there uh, in the outfield in the next inning. So, you know, Hall's going to have to be ready. He's still going to get his time. And he's going to have to come up big in the postseason. I think he'll still be there. It's more interesting when Harper comes back. 
I mean, who you, you're going to have to get get rid of somebody else. I, and I guess, I mean, obviously on paper, we're probably sitting here saying maybe May Tom, but he's obviously swinging the bat well. So that's a decision they're going to have to make here in a few weeks. Yeah, and he was really hot in AAA, too, coming up. That's why they gave him the nod, because T-Mag said they also wanted to bring a lefty bat into the infield after acquiring Sosa on the one broadcast. So that makes sense. So it's going to be interesting to see how they balance that out. You're right about that. But I think we definitely gave credit to all the <clears throat> um, right coaches in this one. And um, now we can move on to the guys that – really took us over the hump in that series. And I would say, if you look at the stars of this series, minus the pitchers, we'll get to those guys in a second. You saw Hoskins just homering left and right. Bohm was continuing his uh, great success. You obviously saw Nick Castellanos continue to contribute as well. I would say uh, those guys, Hoskins, Bohm, Castellanos, if we're talking about the hitters, to me would be the – encompassing stars of the series. And then if we're talking about a game, obviously Mayton for that one game would have been a star of the series, but that's not a series, that's a game. So I would say of the series, I would go with those three guys if I'm talking about the lineup. Yeah, no, I, I so it's, are you asking me who my, my stars are? Yeah, like I would say my three stars were Hoskins, Castellanos, and Boehm when it came to the lineup. There's other guys I could have thrown in there, but those are the three I kind of rolled with. Yeah, those are probably the three you have to go to. Uh, the only other one I'd say is JT's been swinging a hot bat. He's fi- he's fixed this season. Obviously, he had a day off in the in the final game, but overall, I mean, JT's been swinging nothing but a hot bat and his average back up to where we usually see it, his OPS and everything. So I think if I was going to defer for one, I'd throw JT in there. I was also thinking Derek Hall for another guy, but uh, yeah, I thought two the other home guys deserved the top three a little bit. Yeah. So oh, I thought he, so he had a homer in the other game as well. He had three homers in the series because two and then one in the, uh, what was it, the seven to yeah. four? No, well, seven to two game. Yeah, I mean, JT had two or three homers and two triples back-to-back nights. And I think that's what's so tough with the way the team's playing now. And that's the fun part is – you can't really pick two or three guys. It's it's legitimately been the whole team. I mean, I get it, not maybe not series wise, but we talked about it beforehand. I mean, Matt Verling comes up, Vert Verling comes up with a big three run shot in that series and, and sparks the team there. And he, I think it was one one at the time, so he gives you a four one lead or maybe it was four nothing. But either way, he continues the big inning. So that's what's been fun. Is it's not okay? We are going to go downhill if Harper can't continue to hit or if Castellanos can't continue to hit. It's been teammate after teammate picking each other up. No, that's true. And now Castellanos also with his hot streak has gone up to 258, 688 OPS, 10 homers, 22 doubles. And I don't know where they put the RBIs on this. Here we go. 54 RBIs and 46 um runs he does have 103 k's but he's starting to definitely get the contact rate uh going a lot more in the last recent game so i think he's going to continue to build that up uh schwarber's doing what you expect you don't expect him to hit for a great average but he has the rbis and the home runs at 34 and 67 respectively so i think everyone's falling into their place the big thing is oddly enough it seems going back to when JT was able to get rest in Toronto, and then, of course, they had the rest of the break. That extended arrest has seemed to really help JT Real Muto, honestly. That, obviously, if we end up playing Toronto in the playoffs, we're going to have to cross the bridge at that point. But, like, for the regular season, it seemed like that worked out well because it actually got him off his feet more, which actually, I think, with a catcher is honestly a good thing. And Stubbs has obviously played very good as a backup this year, so we've been blessed with that. I think JT hitting really well now also attributes a little bit to the fact that he has fresher legs a bit because he got that extended rest because he didn't play that whole one series up there. You know, absolutely. I think that's been huge, and and you see it with – you see with guys like that, especially catchers, it's a different position. It's a whole different ballgame. So I think it's been huge for him. I think it's going to continue to be huge. And it's huge that Garrett Stubbs 
is able to step up and do that. And we talk about each guy stepping up, and you get that in Stubbs. You haven't had that in the Andrew Knapp in previous years. So, so credit to Stubbs for allowing you to rest JT. Yeah, and also in the um, second-to-last game of the series, Segura also got going. I believe that was the second-to-last game. He had his three-hit game in the third game, and then yeah, obviously Maton doubled yeah, they rested him in the fourth, where Maton then got a three-hit game. So, that worked out well. Um, but you have Segura coming back with fresh legs now. And you have Harper then coming back in either the beginning of September or end of August. The Phillies, on top of getting more Sosa and uh, Cindergaard, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, they also have basically acquired trade acquisitions in Segura coming back from the injury and then Harper coming back from an injury in where the old waiver trade deadline would used to be uh, for the uh, MLB at the end of August. So it, uh, I think those two things play a huge factor if they're able to continue to have these runs. But particularly, like you said, that's going to play a bigger factor if we're able to continue to have these runs also in the multiple games we play the Mets, like you said, to the 25th, because there's a good chance – Harper's not going to play in those games. No, yeah, ex- exactly. Um, except for maybe if he comes back somehow sooner in the end of the second series. But yeah, no, uh, and I, I think that that's where it's important to to keep going. I mean, you you need to be able to um, get going, and I think that's what's most exciting. And I, I think. I know we're about to dive into it here a little bit, but people forget about our trade deadline is you still have Harper coming back. You Obviously, we got Segura back, but you just got him back. So those were like two sneaky acquisitions in itself. Yeah, and you got a guy at Robertson who's already got a save for you in his first game here, so um, who's been doing really good since coming back from his 16 months uh, with his injury, so... Uh, Bilotti's been a pleasant surprise. So they have everything going in the um, bullpen. Uh, plus, I'm pretty sure Sam Coonrod's working his way back. And then Sheriff did make it through into the minors. So if you did have a lefty, unfortunately, go down, you could always add him back to the 40-man roster and then call him up. Um, but since he did make it through down to Lehigh. But I think everything's kind of fallen into place for this team. This year, oh, yeah, which absolutely. is basically what you were getting at um, as well, which it kind of feels like the old school team a little bit more from when we were making the playoffs at first. Like if you talk about 07, you still had some injuries then. Guys stepped up and you were able to make it then and then in 08 it built upon that and you were able to obviously win. So I think it's kind of starting to feel like that where you have different guys pick up the rope and run with it where you didn't have that in past years for really the past decade. Uh, with this team so it's nice to see that now but I think on top of I'm talking about the stars of the series um, we should move into the guys that we actually acquired and first we'll go to the pitching and then we're moving to the uh, two position players we acquired I think uh, Syndergaard obviously got helped out by one Nick Castellano's arm and two Rain um, yeah. but you, you know, uh, he still got a win in his first start. So <laughs> there's that. Um, I would right. still much r- rather see Noah Syndergaard pitch more like he did. That was basically the Syndergaard that was in those three bad starts we heard about when he was with the angels. And then the rest of, I think it was 15 starts were spectacular and ZRA would have been much lower than a three, eight where we kind of got that off Syndergaard because, which is maybe the extra rest did that because as everyone tends to say in baseball, detriment to a sinker ball is always extra rest. So maybe that did him in a little bit. So he'll come back and be better this time around, but I'm not tripping over it because it's his first start, but obviously that's not the quality you would want to see going forward. You would rather see what you saw in most of the starts at the angels. And it turned out to be, article I wrote when we got him three starts kind of did him in to be the 3-8-3 ERA so now he had four off starts this year still not bad four out of 16 ain't bad 
So if you can kind of bounce back from that and get going, you had way more successful starts than bad ones. I think he's still going to be fine. It's just obviously that's not up to par with what we would want to see going forward. That's all. Oh, no, not at all. And I think he will be fine. I think it was the first start. You know, you go to a new team. Uh, you get some. You gotta get the the first game jitters out, even though you've been in the league before. Any time in front of a new fan base and everything, and you're gonna get that. And I think the other big thing with him was, um, the other big thing with that was you had him coming off uh, nine days rest because he was scheduled to pitch the day uh, the day he got traded. So he didn't get he didn't really get to his normal game. So he's kind of came off a little rusty. And you're going to get that a little bit. And, again, he has to adjust to the city, the atmosphere, and everything. And, again, he's got to bounce back. But we'll see how the second start goes. No, I agree with that. I think that's the best way to look at it when it comes to um, Syndergaard because he's had, like I said, it's only four like four out of 16 have been bad. And that's not a bad percentage. You pitch way more successful this year. Year, excuse me, then you pitched unsuccessful. So I think he's going to be fine. And for us, he's really your fourth guy at this point anyway with the way you have the rotation aligned. So having Noah Syndergaard as your fourth guy is a hell of a rotation. Or a fifth, technically, if you're going to put Ranger Suarez in the fourth spot. So either way, it's a good thing to have. So I think they're going to be fine that way. And we brought back David Robertson, um, who is now getting his stuff back. Um, I know that's somebody you uh, really wanted that we talked about in text a couple times to come back potentially. So I'll spin it over to you to let you first comment on that one. Oh, yeah, how cool of a story for him. I mean, you know, he signs the big deal in the offseason of 2019 that come to Philly and help us out as we try to rejuvenate the bullpen finally. And unfortunately for him, he throws out, he gets hurt. He only lasts, I think it was six games. And all of a sudden, he's done. And I thought it was pretty cool. The moment he got traded, he gets on. I forget what they were. Might have been John Clark or somebody else. Sorry. To whoever, I can't remember who it was. And he mentions it. He's like, listen, I, I was ready to play in front of this fan base. It would have been a cool opportunity to get back. And unfortunately, my body failed me. And you know what? I, I'm excited for him. And he already has one save for us, two scoreless innings. And, uh, no, yeah, I'm ready for him to, to keep going and bring this team uh, back to the playoffs and continue to close games out. He's not going to be the, the solidified closer. They're going to continue to go bullpen by matchup, which I honestly love with his age, Dominguez's age, and Dominguez. So it's it's going it's to be a full-on great, great way for this team to, to attack it and get back to the postseason. And he didn't give yeah, much up. Yeah, it, yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. They didn't give a whole lot up for really – the biggest guy, if you really think about it, they gave up in all the trades was Oh Hoppy because they moved him into the top 100 prospects list um, as a catcher, I think, this offseason. Uh, but yes. either way, he was in that. So, um, and I really like, I got to watch him a lot from the MILB TV. I be a good catcher, but the, but the key word is he's going to be a good catcher. We don't need a good catcher for about six years or five, whatever Correct. more JT. Ha- so that's why I'm, I was perfectly fine with swapping a hobby because the big thing with Marsh is, and um, I think he just needs to have the right hitting coach. And I feel like log might be able to be the right hitting coach for him over time. And Harper was excited about bringing in a guy like him. He talked about it when he came on with T-Mac and then he talked about it on that Apple TV game to those people saying he likes how they have years of control for him and they could just keep plucking him in there and get his hitting better and better over time. So you got your star player happy with that acquisition too. So that worked out fine. Uh, So I think that's Plus he has the Charlie Blackman beard. So what's not the like, Uh, right? So I think, and remember Charlie Blackman didn't get going until he was like 20, Five twenty six. You know, maybe we have the next Charlie Blackman. He already has the look. Um, <clears throat> but also, Ooh. Charlie complimented him big time. I don't know if you saw that, but there was an article. Charlie Manuel talked about how he really likes the defensive tools of Brandon Marsh and likes the fact that he thinks he can be a well-rounded hitter that has more power and all that over time. So I think you have the right people in organization to be able to help him. Because even if 
needed. We know how much Chuck still kind of is around the organization. So like those guys, Boa, like anybody can help those guys with how much great talent is around that organization from former baseball managers or players. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's what you're going to get in a guy like them. And I think it's exciting to watch and everyone, I, I Brandon Marsh is going to be a good player. I truly believe that. I think he is fixable like our guys have talked about and everything. So I'm ready to watch him grow and everything. And, and he's going to stay in a platoon role right now, but we'll see how he grows. But, um, no, absolutely. And he's he's still a young guy. He's under team control. So that's why he costs it a little bit more. And I'm okay with that kind of deal. Yeah, I am too. I think for a guy you have control for all the years, you still have some control of Veerling, I believe, if I'm thinking correctly. So you're going to have that platoon potentially if you – want it for at least a few years and Deerling also just profiles to me as a very good fourth outfitter so why wouldn't you want to keep him around if he wants to stay around even if he's not going to be starting because you have a great fielder a guy that steals bases a lot of the times he gets on a good yeah. runner from first to third anytime so I would say he profiles as a very good fourth outfielder at the very least so he's a good guy to keep around even if Marsh develops I think that's until at least Ortiz or somebody else comes up. I think that's uh, a good thing this team has. And I like that platoon because we already saw it have success. Veerling smacked a home run and Marsh had a hit in his first game. Then he had a hit. But did he have two hits in the last game? I know he had eight. Uh, it, I get one hit in, in the last. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think you are right. But. Uh, he was able to get two hits in the series. I think he's going to get going more over time. And like Andrew said, I'm excited to have a guy like him because, one, I feel like at the very least, he's going to profile as the next Kiermaier, that even if he's not hitting exceptionally well all the time, he's going to be a gold glove center fielder. And if you end up with the Phillies, like the Rays typically were able to put enough, well, not always, but sometimes put enough guys around Kiermaier that doesn't matter if you have one guy that's not the sexiest hitter if he's uh, one of the best fielders or the best fielder on your team so that also kind of cancels it out even if he becomes a 240 career hitter that has more doubles and power over time and hits more like Kiermaier does getting the fielding that continues to be gold glove after gold glove I don't think I'm good at complaining about the fact that he hits 240 to 240 but well, no, no. Not that I'm not going to be complaining about the f- – so that's the low end, I think, of Marsh. But I'm saying if that's the case, I, I'm not even going to complain about that. No, you're absolutely right. And I think that's the, the important thing, too, is people need to realize they, you don't need his offense, really. Assuming you're healthy everywhere else, you're going to score your runs, so you're going to need it for defense, and that's why they made the trade. Well, also, I was kind of surprised. I think it's just because a lot of people liked what they heard about Ohapi as a prospect, because only, I think, a few people that complain about stuff really watch the minor leagues that much. So I don't think they really, like, watched them a lot, but uh, but there's yeah. a few people that have. Um, so I think it's just that is really the big thing that's led to complaining, because if you look at Moore, she reminds you a lot of a lefty – they have a di- completely different swing path, but I mean, like they have some flaws in their swings of a lefty veerling field first needs to get his bat a little bit more consistent as a whole. And Philly really likes when you read stuff about veerling and the way he plays and how guys really like, they compliment him in the field and talk about him making great plays. So it's kind of weird to me that they, where I really like Matt veerling too, but that's why I also really like Marsh because he reminds me of a guy that you can kind of mold and he's younger as well so he's just entering his prime years you can kind of mold into a very good player where veerling to me is like your third outfielder or maybe a very good fourth outfielder so like wherever position you try to put him so i think uh that's the difference or an infielder now since matt veerling plays all over the place so i guess he's really bad realistically the phillies are probably making matt veerling into ben zobel and question. then Britt marsh is good <laughs> yeah what I guess my question to you would be, who would you say is better, Erling or Marsh? I think the platoon's the best way to go, because I think Marsh is a better hitter against righties. 
And I think Veerling is definitely a better hitter at this point of his career against lefties. I do think over time, I kind of just hit it at a little bit, but I think over time, Marsh is going to become the starting center fielder, and that's why the Phillies uh, kind of just accidentally, smartly moved Veerling all around the field. Uh, yeah. That's a nice thing now, because now you have a center fielder that looks like he's going to potentially become your center fielder, and now Matt Veerling can literally just become Ben Zobras. Gotcha. Without switch hitting. Yeah. Uh, so, unless if he wants to start switch hitting, then go for it. But the the fact that I think Veerling is really kind of solidifying his role on this team to be able to do whatever. He's even played third well this year. Uh, I think that's really going to help him having staying weight on the team. Because Thompson really likes him. It seems like Kevin Long really likes him. Uh, so I think I, I don't see him really going anywhere. I kind of see the outfield staying the way it is for a while because you have Castellanos locked up, you have Bryce locked up, you have control of Morris, you have Schwarber obviously locked up, uh, and you have some control of Veerling. I don't think there's a reason to think, other than if somebody propels their way through the minor leagues, that the outfield is going to necessarily change. And at that point, you might just do a Dodgers thing because, like I said, Veerling plays every position. You don't have to get rid of him if another outfielder comes up. So other than shortstop and catcher. So I, I think that's a big side of a guy like him, too. The Phillies are starting to develop people correctly, which is a big difference than we saw in years past, where Gabe, I think, was just raw, and now he's starting to do that with Giants players, and they actually got some pretty good stuff for Darren Ruff from the match. So, I mean, he was able to get some decent trade chips and develop guys to be able to get traded for the Do- not the Dodgers for the Giants, um, where the Phillies now with Thompson are able to kind of really mend these guys into roles. My most interesting thing is who's going to be that great fourth infielder going forward because I think they have a lot of guys in the minors, plus guys like that Baylor kid and a bunch of other infielders that are still coming up through the pipeline in Triple A and Double A. That's going to be the more interesting thing, because I feel like your outfield with your top four, if you're going to include Veerling in the outfield still and not in everything, uh, is kind of set where your infield is going to be Maton, is going to be Munoz, is going to be one of the kids in the minors. That's always your extra guy there. I think that's a good problem to have, though, because in the past, the flip side we would always talk about is, oh, where the heck are these guys that we're going to find that are going to come up in this situation? We don't have anybody. Nobody's here. There's nobody here. Where now it's the opposite, and you're going, well, who out of these three, four people is going to do So it's nice to have that dialogue rather than the one that we had three to four years ago or even two to three years ago where you're like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> so that, there's a big difference, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's where it's going to get exciting is the team does finally have that depth and everything. And they have a very basic what we want a Scott King to be. You know, that's a good point. But I think Beerling also adds a little bit more just because he started in the outfield and then moved to the infield and started fulfilling that role where Kingery had to learn how to run routes in the outfield, which I don't think he ever got the sexiest at. He kind of just yeah. was was able to get to anything because of his speed. So yeah, I do. I, I but, that. That, but, but yeah, that is a good point, though. He kind of did fill that role that they wanted Kingery to play the everything and he was really never able to do. And this year wasn't able to do much through around injuries and stuff in the minors. So it'll be interesting to see if he's somebody that maybe just goes elsewhere eventually and finds a backup role, less shorn to like an Oakland A's team or Tampa or somebody that can figure him out a little bit at least, but it'll be interesting what happens with Scott Kingery. No, I agree. But, but um, I think also I kind of brushed past. I agreed with you, too, on some of the stuff. I kind of went right into Brad Morris and never really talked about uh, the fact of David Robertson after you talked about him. But, um, but I do also really like the fact that we have um, Robertson back because I think, like Andrew said, it's – kind of that second chance he's able to come back and really 
reprove himself or prove himself really uh to the fan base and i also think he's a guy that's not the uber expensive guy going forward so say he does have great success you could probably keep giving him one year deals until he retires potentially you might have a guy that he seems to really like philly if he does well for you you can kind of just keep doing that one year whatever he got paid this year and what he got paid this year for a one year deal just keep kind of matching that and then he might just keep coming back for that, and that'll be A-OK with me. So I think he sets you up for success. I think Syndergaard, what you said to me in text, is kind of going to be the way to do that. I was thinking just because of the way my brain kind of works, like maybe you could have just gave him that one-year deal since he kind of had the high three ZRA and be like, we're going to give you one year, like eight, one year, seven, try to like, like give him a like a medium deal just because he only had a solid year statistically and try to play off of that like some gms do rather than the fact that that's only really four out of 16 start but if you and maybe you could get him in a little bit lower i was thinking maybe they would try to do that off of the bat just to have him for another year is a very good in the five mix but yeah. i kind of agree with you it makes some sense to just wait and see how he plays out but i would say if he plays out well uh, you might as well just give him another one year or even if he wants a two year, if he gets going, I would be fine with that for Noah Syndergaard because he's also in a rotation with a guy he's been with in the past that'll probably be able to kind of get him going again too in wheels. So I think that move works out well too, not just because you got another good pitcher, but you got a pitcher that has connectivity with another pitcher on your team because they were two of the guys that were supposed to be manning a Mets rotation for years to come. So it would kind of be nice if both of them were in our rotation for years to come because that'll be a kick in the balls uh, to Mets fans. So it's always good to have that. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh-huh. Anytime, anytime you can scare the Mets, you're Mets fans. But this year, I, this question is probably going to be the hardest one um that i would have to answer but who's been the kind of i'm trying to think of the right way to ask this question like the unexpected top performer this year for you uh for this team because i feel like they've had about five or more (laughs) of guys that have stepped up beyond kind of what you would have thought so basically who's like my most surprised player is that basically yeah like basically who's the guy that's the best performer of like yeah the under expected you didn't expect them to do as well as they're doing well you expect like you expect them to be decent but they're really having a good year like somebody like that like a Stubbs or something like that i guess they gotta give us the edge to alec bohm i mean i i i expected Growing pains from him, but I think his fielding's come along nicely. Obviously, he's not perfect, but I think he's really developed throughout the season. And then his bat. I get the power is not really what we thought it would be, but, I mean, he's a very good contact hitter. He's starting to find the gaps more, so I got to give the I gotta give the edge to Alec Bohm. Like, if you would have told me he was playing well enough, and I get Harper's hurt, but if he was playing well enough to, to put him in the three spot and still succeed like that, I would have thought it might have been a little long of a season, but I think he's stepped up big. Yeah, I think Boom has stepped up big. I think if I'm going with a lineup guy, um, my guy would be just because of how big he's been able to step up and immediately go in the middle of the lineup. I would have to go with Hall just because uh, Lawn Ball Hall has come up, and he's come up at the right age for Philly's first base. I think he just recently turned uh, yeah, the 25th of July. Uh, 27, but 26, 27 is, is when the Phillies first baseman is always blocked by somebody. Um, come up. It's funny, it's always first. Yeah, and uh, he's doing really well. That's also why Joey Manessi made that terrible play the other day. <laughs> it's, uh, it's on the Nationals <laughs> when he was actually doing really well in the Phillies minor leagues. But anyway, back to the Phillies. Um, Derek Hall, I think, is a guy that you might be able to continue to have going forward as your very good bench bat secondary DH, um, since you're not always going to have Nick Castellanos 
DH every game. So you can put Derek Hall in against guys that you know just leave the ball up against lefties, and he's just going to be able to kind of rake that thing. And I think he's going to be a good platoon player going forward uh, just because you don't have, obviously, that steady position for him. So he's going to have to platoon since Reese is also playing very well. The only way you would affect that is if one starts playing really bad, you would just try to get rid of the other. Or not the other, the yeah. one that's playing bad, I meant to say. But like, I think Hall's a guy that's going to fit in well. He would be my guy in the lineup. A guy that I have been happy with in the sense of, I think coming into this year, this was kind of the year because the Phillies have guys on the open market. A lot of, there's a few big infielders that the Phillies have obviously been rumored to potentially go after the big ones being <clears throat> Trey Turner. Um, so I think Segura put the Phillies in a spot of really having to think about that more since if he's been playing really well, he's been fielding the second base position. But at the same time, what are the Phillies going to do? Because if you can bring in a guy like Trey Turner, and I don't think you're going to go, well, we have Gene Segura. We're not going to sign Trey Turner, and we know they won't start to play. So that'll be a good offseason conundrum. But I think Gene Segura is another guy that I've been happy with this year because he's got better and better at fielding at second over time and not just having the gunner arm. And he's now basically played the last two years gold glove level second base and also has hit well enough to be able to stay there for, I think, one more year of his contract. So it's going to be interesting to see what they decide to do there. Plus, if it is only, I think, one more year of his contract, you might as well keep him anyway if you're able to get him enough ABs, moving him around because he's such a good at bat as well. But that'll be interesting to see what they're able to do at that point because I think Gene Segura played himself into now staying to the end of his deal, where I think coming into this year, because of the free agent market, not necessarily because of Gene Segura, people were looking at it going, well, he might be the odd man out because we knew Didi would be gone. His contract was up and he's gone sooner than we thought. Segura would kind of be the odd man out. Now it's like, well, everybody's playing well. Who would be the odd man out if you got Trey Turner? <laughs> so like that would be a, that's a uh, interesting thing that's kind of set itself up with the rumors that have gone out there, obviously, uh, going into the offseason. And we know how much Bryce Harper likes Trey Turner. <laughs> so, yeah, right. And that sexy, smooth slide of Trey Turner, you know. That slide in the game right there. No, I love Trey Turner. He's one of my favorite, and I think he's undervalued very, very heavy. So, I'd be off. Oh, he is. Yeah, he's, he's, he would be... I'm surprised he's not more noticed with the – well, actually, no, I'm not. The Dodgers lineup is absolutely loaded. Um, He would probably be more noticed with the Phillies a little bit because they we have a very good loaded lineup, but it's not like the Dodgers where you have a bunch of guys that you're like, okay, well, if Cody Bellinger stops looking like he's high off at 18 blunts every single game. Um, (laughs) Well, well, hypothetically, if we got him real quick before we move on – uh, I, I mean, you, you get Turner. He's your leadoff. You go Trey That's Turner. Too. Yeah, you, you go Trey that. Turner, Reese, Bryce, Kyle, and Kyle can literally be your Ryan Howard in the middle. And I mean, think about that. Trey Turner, Hoskins, and Harper getting on all the time, and then all of a sudden, Kyle cleans the bases. I almost guarantee at least like two grand slams this season. Oh yeah, that's true. And then whenever you sub in Derek Hall in the middle of the lineup, you have another guy that can just mash it out of the yard when guys get on base. So you're yeah, gonna you have go, a lot of guys that are around to be able to do that. Exactly. You go cast about the five. Um, then you probably go JT six, Bohm seven, like that. That's unstoppable. No, yeah, that's why it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But I think it's all. Um, Definitely coming into place nicely with the way things are developing. And also, I think we have to wrap up this episode talking about the bullpen because who would ever think we would be talking about a Phillies bullpen with great exceptional happiness um, in the recent years? <laughs> in a but, final, it's taken long enough. Yeah. You have Andrew Bellotti, who talk about a great comeback story. He's another very good comeback story. He had to go through a lot off of the field. Yep. Um, 
and was able to come back pitch exceptional this year. And I think a guy that's almost become overlooked and underrated at this point just because he's only pitched, I think, 25 innings, maybe 24, one of those two. Brogdon's pitched very well in the games he's pitched this year. He just hasn't been seen as much because he hasn't been around as much. Now that he's gotten going, if he's able to, he's kind of your more rested arm. So if he's able to continue to progress, uh, he hasn't pitched nearly as many innings as um, everybody else. So I think he could potentially um, be a guy that really steps it up for you going into like the end of August or September months since he has one of the most fresh arms in your bullpen and we've been seeing good stuff from him lately as well. So I think he's a guy that's going to be interesting to watch down the stretch for the bullpen for sure, because he reminds you a lot of Ryan Matson. I know people say that all the time, but the way he's so lanky has to change up. You, uh, he reminds you a lot of a guy like him and Madsen took a, qu- a quiet minute to develop. It's not like he developed right away. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I think it's fine. It's awesome. It's fine. A bullpen to go out there and be excited about I can actually trust the bullpen every day. Um, Alvarado has been a whole different pitcher since being called back up. Brad Ann's been more than excellent this year. Sir Anthony Dominguez has been more than excellent this year. It, it's incredible. And I'm all for it. Yeah, well, Alvarado adding that cutter has really changed this whole dynamic. Um, yeah. Well, a lot of whoever... the cutter. Oh, yeah. And, and it's got to be Cotham. Like, you, you gave a lot, of, a lot of credits early in the show. Yeah, but for Jose, I would say it, it, it's just changed because all the a lot of the other guys didn't have the same control problem with Jose Alvarez, where it seemed like that cut or Jose Alvarez, Jose Alvarado, where it seemed like getting that cutter is almost like if he's having some issues, that's now his kind of get over pitch at times too, which then straightens him out and gets him going again. Where he didn't have a pitch like that before, where if he was off plane, he just stayed off plane, and you're like, oh son of a, <laughs> so yeah, like. I think now having that really helps um, the fact speaking of, speaking of that. Um, one of the funnier things in the broadcast yesterday, which I thought this guy acted like an ass when it came to complimenting on the woman and stuff. That one thing he said about pianos was absolutely hilarious after he said Bob Boone used to kill the grass running he was so slow and he said we used to say this one thing you can carry a piano on your back but don't stop and play the son of a bitch as you're going around the bases and i just started i was like did did he really just say (laughs) and the first thing he said also was i knew john crook when he had two balls that was literally i think the first thing people said yeah no he, he did not give himself a good description it's uh, i i i guess people have to talk about it but he, he he got what he wanted i think he wanted this and he he's got people talking about it for the wrong reason and he's uh no he had his chance to get back in baseball and he failed yeah, and that's the thing, because if you talked about the players, like they talked about it on the broadcast, the players really love talking about him about the game and stuff. It's just he never knows what to say about his social life. That's where he always is screwed up. It's it's not Pete Rose talking about baseball that he screws up. It's Pete Rose talking about Pete Rose in life that he always screws up and doesn't take onus of. Where I think that's kind of what I realized over time. I know in a past episode we talked about P. Rose and the fact that he should be obviously based off of his baseball accolades in the Hall of Fame. But I think the big reason he isn't is because he couldn't. If he could just have said before or even now, I screwed up. I did mess up then. I shouldn't have done X, Y, and Z. I'm regretful for that. I think that would have went a long way. And you never really saw that from P. Rose. And that's kind of what... I think the breaking point comes to when he's not in the Hall of Fame, honestly, even yeah. from the veterans committees. I think it's they never saw regret. They never saw remorse for his off the field action with one, potentially an underage woman and two betting on the game. So now the betting on the game thing. The fact that it was when he was a manager and not against his team is a whole different conundrum you can get into in a whole 70 minute episode of a podcast. But. 
the fact of what else he did on the field and he can't even answer the questions very morally. That's the issue I have. But he, the the thing with Rose is he's one of those guys that he's so good when he talks about baseball, when he talks about anything else, it's just an answer. <laughs> hey, like it's pretty much him and Lenny. Rose was the guy from the 80s and then played into the beginning of Lenny Dyser's career. And then Dyser was the guy of the 90s that were the guys that just, if you haven't talking about baseball, you're fine. Haven't talking about anything else, the world's in. Yeah. Right. So like, the, the, there's just certain guys that are like that. And I think for both of them, it's because of issues with. Rose probably more alcohol and Deutsch are probably more cocaine, but uh, <laughs> I think that played into the fact of the matter as well with the, the way that those guys' personalities were so and are. So I think that's a... Uh, I think there's a lot of different factors. Not necessarily that. No, I don't think it's just that either. It's probably how they were raised. It's probably the type of community... Like, that... Like, all that type of stuff, I'm sure, played in as well. But it's a shame because he's one of those guys that just pisses you off so much because if he was able to just show some regret and remorse, he would be allowed around a lot more. And you still saw the players talk about how they like talking about baseball with them and everything. And the guys like talking baseball with them, like Bo and everything. But you just don't want him around that much because he puts his foot in his mouth. So it's like, that's the issue you have with Pete Rose. Like, I wonder how he talked with John Clark, because I know he did the uh, takeoff, or I think that's called takeoff, right? Oh, yeah, I always forget the name of the show. But yeah, it was with John the Clark. Clark. I remember watching yeah. that. He did the John Clark thing. I wonder how he um, did on that, because I didn't watch that. Um, but... Uh, maybe I will, but I don't know. I don't like I, in the booth. I thought he was just kind of the old school, like the normal Pete Rose that just kind of shoots the crap and talks like the team used to talk. Where it's just the thing that did him in wasn't how he talked in the broadcast. The thing that did him in was how he talked after the. Um, so I was both. The, he handled himself poorly in, in the press box or yeah, in the booth. And you could even hear Tom McCarthy's frustration. I mean, he didn't flat out say anything to him, but you could just hear it in his voice. His voice changed a little bit, and after uh, Pete Rose spoke for a little bit, he quickly changed the subject, and, and Rose tried to call him out on it. And he's like, I'm just describing the play or whatever. You, you could tell that he wasn't, he wasn't thrilled with it. And again, I think Pete Rose knew exactly what he was doing. He wanted people to talk about him, and that's, that's what he got. And now people are talking about him. So uh, I think Pete Rose did exactly what he wanted to, everything to happen. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. He wasn't the best. But what I'm talking about, like, he didn't put his foot... Like, he said something you shouldn't have said on the broadcast because of a story. On the free broadcast, he reacted to a question about something that was a bad situation he got into years ago. And call like, just reacted very poorly to that. I think that's what got people riled up more than the fact that he said no shit and all that on the air i don't think that really pissed off a lot of people but i could be wrong i feel like the side that probably pissed off more of philadelphia was the fact that he treats he still seems to not really understand how you're supposed to treat a woman no, i think I, that kind of pissed off more yeah no i mean i, I agree i think that's a guy a lot of people are mad too no don't get me wrong i'm not saying what he did before the game wasn't bad that was just i mean that was definitely bad i just think uh he, all around, he just handled himself poorly this weekend. It was a shame because now it's become the bigger storyline than the Phillies went, having a great week, splitting with the Braves, sweeping the Nationals, and, and then putting on a great alumni weekend. And, and I think P. Rose has started to overshadow it with what happened yesterday. And yeah, and I just think it's a shame because baseball gave the Phillies permission. They gave him another shot. And instead of, I mean, I always listen to the 97.5, and Tyrone said it perfect. I mean, um, yeah, Tyrone, Tyrone said it perfect. I think he was the one that said it, but it was that uh, Pete Rose had a chance to, to help himself, and he didn't. He had five years, and this is what he said, he had five years to since that uh, incident with, with the um, 
female that came out. He had five years to prepare a good statement because he hasn't been speaking to the media, and that's the way you portray yourself. Like, it's going to be tough to get fans to want him in the Hall of Fame after that. I know a lot of people, I think, have, have kind of went out on him now. Yeah, I feel like Pete Rose is one of those guys that will ultimately get in by probably not, I think, the gener- Gen Z, but the next couple when they don't really realize all the hubba bubba surrounding Pete Rose and they kind of just look at it statistically and go, oh, crap, this guy should. But I feel like eventually he'll get in from one of those generations because eventually over the next 50 so years, you're going to have a generation of voters that doesn't that, that that would then be from a hundred and like what five years ago. So like there's like so I feel like over time on battle he might get in from one of those committees just because of that because you're not going to have people that are the knowest of the knowledge unless if they look it up and don't just care about the fact that he was one of the best players of all time. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I. Hear. So I do feel like eventually, but it would probably be when we're older, if he does get in, because it would be by a generation that just doesn't pay attention to stuff that happened at that point over 100 years ago, and then votes him in off of his baseball. Uh, That would be what has it be. But no, I'm just saying in the broadcast booth, like obviously that story, you shouldn't have brought up that story about when the guy hit a home run and the guy was like, oh, no shit. Uh, But the like some of the stuff he talked about in terms of baseball like it reminded me of when they used to have Pete Rose and you would hear the highlights when he would like do stuff for the radio and stuff back in the day and he would just talk about the game and shoot the crap like it did remind you of those old school highlights you can find online sometime minus the fact that he told that one story that he probably shouldn't have said but the that's the that's the thing I was saying where I feel like what did him in was the post. But it is what it is. Um, moving on to brighter pastures, um, I think we should definitely congratulate Bake McBride and Ron Reed for getting into the uh, Phillies Wall of Fame. Um, and both of those guys were a big contribution um, to the 1980s team as well. It's kind of surprising they weren't put in sooner when we have some guys from Andrew and I's generation that have been put into the Wall of Fame. Meanwhile, Bake McBride and Ron Reed are from the 80s and haven't been put into the Wall of Fame, but that's not here nor there, I guess. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I know. It, I, I thought they did a great job with that. And um, I got credit to them. And I, I think, um, what am I looking for? Uh, no, and I think it was cool for him, and I don't know if you felt the same way, and obviously, you know, I hear stories from my dad and uncles and such about the 1918, but those are two guys, you know, not being from that generation, you don't really hear about, uh, at least for me, so it's kind of cool to, to watch all weekend and learn more about those two individuals, like I always, you always hear about Mike Schmidt, Larry Boa, Bob Boone, you know, Steve Carlton, uh, Tug McGraw and everything, but like those are two guys, you know, I feel like you don't get to hear about much. So, you know, I'm, I'm watching that here and everything. And then I'm starting to look them up a little bit. And I thought it was cool, cool, a little different there to, to get two names. Maybe I, w- maybe I wasn't familiar with, and I don't know if you felt the same way. Um, or if you, I mean, obviously I've heard of them, but, um, but again, not guys I'm overly familiar with. I don't know if you felt the same way. No, that's how I was with those two. So that's how it was. It was cool this weekend to get to see that. Also it was cool on Friday. Uh, the 50th uh, celebration for Dan Baker. So congratulations yes. to Dan Baker for his 50th season as well. So all of those things were cool and uh, well put together. And then hopefully Ron Reed got to meet Matt Beerling. Um, <laughs> that's something he was trying to link up with. The fellow uh, Notre Dame uh, yep. alum wanted to meet Matt Beerling. So hopefully they were able to uh, link that up. Where if Ron stayed in Philly for an extra day, they could have even went out today since so he's not doing anything today. Matt Veerling, so, you know, maybe, maybe they could have even got lunch. But <laughs> either way, hopefully he, they got to meet each other. But <clears throat> I think wrapping this one up, 
Um, I'm just happy and delighted this year that at this point of the season and past podcasts, we would be talking about the detriments and the downfalls. Oh, right, yeah. Finally a positive one. <laughs> yeah, we're finally in August at a positive one in a good spot in the wild card because of the sweep of the Padres that the Dodgers had who desperately suck against the Dodgers, the Padres do. Um, something they're going to have to figure out, but we hope they don't. Um, I think the Phillies are continuing to move their way up and have a chance to move up in the first wild card spot, which by default will probably move them closer to the Mets. And we know what the Mets sometimes decide to do in September. So we'll have to see. We have to get ahead of the Braves first. But um, I think the Phillies are moving in the right direction and adding a great pitcher like Syndergaard is only going to help because Zach Eflin's a very up in the air on if he ever will be able to come back this year. And then if he does, that's just an added bonus because now you have six starters that are pretty good. And Zach Eflin might be able to be that bonus guy out of the bullpen in the playoffs that's able to give you a couple innings that you tend to see a few teams have in the postseason. So if he does come back, that's just an added bonus. So I think they set themselves up uh, for a lot of success. And also set themselves up for a lot of success by getting rid of Yuri's Familia, who couldn't pitch anymore. Um, So that also was helpful. Uh, So I think uh, everything definitely is moving in the right direction. Yeah, no, absolutely. I 1,000% agree with you. It's finally fun. And and again, um, it's fun to talk about this team. And I look forward to, you know, getting back on here more with you as you know, we get through the, the rest of the season and get to continue to talk about some positive baseball. Yeah, as we said at the beginning, the Phillies have the Marlins next at home, so it'll be interesting to see in CBP what they're able to do against the Fish. You would expect some continued success this year uh, with the way they played this year against them. The one pitcher, that pitcher Meyer, that pitch good, also got injured, which is unfortunate. Uh, I saw, I think he needs Tommy John already early in his career. You never want to see that for a kid, but um, so they're not going to have him pitching. Uh, So that's one guy out of the rotation. They did keep Lopez, so we'll have to see if we have to face him since he's a pretty darn good pitcher. But I still think against the Fish, the Phillies should be able to prevail because even if you get a great pitching game, the Phillies have more in their lineup to be able to find a way to push through than the Marlins do. Yeah, I completely agree. You swept them going into the Austin break. I, I think you'll take at least two, especially at home. So, no, I, I'm looking forward to it. Go get me two more wins, and we'll be back on here talking about another series victory. Yeah, hopefully so. Thank you for joining us for this one. Uh, the Philadelphia Phillies podcast on Sportsman News, where we talked about the star players of the year this far that have got us to this great point in the wild card, the great success of 9-1 and one in the last 10-5 to five game winning streak uh, for the Phillies. There's been a couple good um, winning streaks this year for the Phillies, which is another thing we haven't said in past years either. So it's nice to see that as well. Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed day. You can follow Andrew at AJ underscore Santangelo on Twitter and myself at JJ Blair 26 on Twitter. Stay safe, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the baseball season. Go Phillies.